patients, we are not experts in our anatomical, uh, you know, uh, parts. And then also when, a, when we are given this news that, hey, you know, you are going to have to go through the surgery because you have this tumor mass and we have to operate on it. Um, when, when that information is presented to the patient, obviously it's a, a lot of emotions and it's very traumatizing. Um, and then also given the fact that we don't understand exactly what's going on with you know, our kidney or our lung or our brain, uh, it creates a lot of anxiety uh, for that lack of knowledge or lack of information. So I think um, in this case where a patient had kidney cancer and it was a very massive tumor, it's difficult to define massive to somebody that doesn't have a baseline to compare that to. So in this case, uh, Dr. Tomaszewski, a surgeon at MD Anderson, um, basically shared the model with their patient to explain to them like, look, this is what's happened. Here are your blood vessels feeding into the tumor directly and the tumor is invading the entire kidney and we are going to do our best. But you know, I wanted to share this with you so you have a better understanding of what your anatomy is. And also I want to assure you that I'm going to rehearse your surgery ahead of time before I do it on you so that I already know the game plan before the big day. Hello and welcome to Say Hi to the Future, a podcast aimed at highlighting the human side of human ingenuity, clever, inventive, and original thinking. My name is Ken Tenser, curator of Say Hi to the Future and CEO of Spiderworks, a leading business consultancy for mid-market organizations and entrepreneurs globally. With me today is Dr. Jacques and Smriti Zanavel. They founded Lazarus 3D to help doctors achieve surgical perfection by allowing them to rehearse a surgery before the real thing on a 3D printed replica of their patient. The Zanavelds started their company while they were PhD students at Baylor College of Medicine, where they were conducting research focused on identifying and treating the genetic causes of inherited eye diseases. Both Smriti and Jacques have a proven track record as successful scientists with over a dozen scientific publications, each in the areas of human genetics and 3D printing. They've built Lazarus 3D from a concept in a kitchen to a thriving company and are launching their first medical device, PreSure, pre-operative surgical rehearsal models on January 1st, 2022. Like this video if you enjoy our show and subscribe to our channel. Leave us a comment with who we should interview next. Thank you for tuning in and I hope you enjoy the show. Welcome to the show. It's, it's wonderful to have you on Say Hi to the Future. Absolutely. Thank you so much for the opportunity to uh, speak with you today. Yeah, thanks so much. Excited to be on Say Hi to the Future. <laughs> <laughs> so... The two of you have a really, really monumental event happening, um, first of, of 2022. So tell us a little bit about Lazarus 3D and, and this, this incredible um, first product. Yeah, so we started our company, Lazarus 3D, in our kitchen about five years ago. And at the end of this month, so on the 1st of 2022, uh, we will be launching our medical device product called PreSure for preoperative surgical rehearsal. And what this allows is your doctor to actually rehearse your surgery hands-on on a physical 3D printed replica of you. This replica has the same mechanical characteristics, so he can actually, he or she can actually cut it open, perform that operation, you know, experience bleeding, experience what might occur uh, when treating the patient. So just like practice makes perfect in every other part of our lives, uh, we're letting surgeons practice that particular patient's surgery ahead of time. So th that's amazing. And I, and I have to guess that, I mean, human error, I mean, and it's no fault. I mean, we're all human. Unfortunately, as a surgeon, being human can, you know, <laughs> It can be challenging. So how does this help with, with human error? How will it you know, take away from some of the issues that some people have you know, post-surgery? 
Yeah, so I think for surgeons, what's most important is experience. And surgeons learn from experience and so does everyone else in life. That's how we get better at our tasks. Um, and so in surgery, unfortunately, they don't have a way to uh, do this, what we are talking about, you know, doing a rehearsal ahead of time. So they're learning on the go by practicing sort of on their first set of patients. And even with that said, as they go on and become competent and, you know, uh, start excelling in their skills to perform these surgeries, there are always cases where there is a oddball case and you've never seen that before. And there was no opportunity for you to have that experience ahead of the curve. So that's, that's the problem that we think is uh, very real. And the way that we think we are changing this is by providing surgeons this opportunity for the first time where they're able to do a rehearsal uh, in a safe environment at no risk to the patient. So that significantly helps with that learning curve uh, because, you know, for a golfer, the learning curve is on the field and, you know, no lives are, um, you know, on the line. However, for a surgeon, that's not the case. So we are helping them reduce that learning curve by giving them this safe opportunity to do surgeries where quality of care or patient lives are not compromised. And that's game changing for them. So um, it's, it's really two um, sides of the coin. One, where you're just starting out and you need that critical experience uh, and you're able to obtain it in a safe way on a non-human. And then the second is you're a really thriving surgeon. You know, you um, have uh, really been operating for many, many years. And now you are seeing those very complex cases um, that are very challenging and unique in their own ways. Well, that, that's incredible. I mean, there, there's one thing I would like to say, though. Um, if you've ever seen me golf, I do think that that's life threatening. Um, <laughs> but, but, but I do I do take your point very well. Um, so traditionally, though, how, how would a, a surgeon or, or a surgeon learn or practice to be a, a surgeon? And, and to how would um, the more experienced ones with the harder cases, how would they have traditionally, um, you know, prepared? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's very interesting. So medicine has always been a conservative field and it has to be because so much of what you do can really fundamentally affect people's lives. So surgeons are incredible people. They've, they've typically spent over a decade studying, right? So they, they go to college, then they go to medical school, then they go to residency, then they do a fellowship. And up until the late residency, early fellowship, typically they aren't performing much in the way of actual hands-on skills of actually operating on patients. And when they do start out, it's a guided experience where if Smriti is the attending physician, I would be assisting her, I might help close up, do some suturing, but any of the more complex aspects, um, I would observe. And then over time, slowly, I would start taking on more and more responsibilities. And, and how they approach the cases uh, in the first place is really their reliance on the MRI or CT scan data. So those are 2D images of 3D structures that are internal to us. And usually it's a stack. So it's a series uh, of slices that are being imaged with under these imaging modalities, right? So um, for this, uh, whether you're a young surgeon or whether you're a highly trained surgeon, you're using um, those images to rely on uh, understanding the anatomy, understanding the disease state, and also creating your surgical plan. So in that process, you're sort of imagining what the 3D anatomy looks like in your head. So again, we're relying on your skills and your experience, uh, you know, and, and how good you are at visualizing sort of 2D uh, into 3D in an imaginary way if that makes sense. And then on top of that, once if you have a picture of the anatomy, trying to plan how you're actually going to treat that patient and then executing that plan. So that's a very challenging skill. And we're really here to try and make this more intuitive, to try and provide as much support for these incredible surgeons 
um, uh, doing their life-saving work every day. Wow. So how real is, is the experience that, that you provide? Yeah, so um, very real. <laughs> so we, we can like share a video um, if sure. that works. Um, but also I can show you uh, just what some of our models look like. So um, here is a heart um, and I can give it a good squeeze. Um, so in a real surgical rehearsal, this heart, if it was cut into, um, actually has all of the internal anatomy as well as a defect that was derived from the patient's imaging data sets. And then also it's, it can be perfused. So if they were to cut into a structure that uh, was critical to this procedure and create a complication, they would be able to experience that on the rehearsal, uh, during the rehearsal on the pre-shore model ahead of the curve. Um, and so now we're going to share a video um, that sort of captures this. Here is a surgery uh, being performed on a breast. Um, this is for a procedure called a lumpectomy, where they remove the lump from the breast tissue um, <clears throat> and sort of uh, compared to a mastectomy where they remove the entire breast. So here you saw that the surgeon had made their first incision and after they cut into it and identify the lesion, they're trying to basically resect it uh, by cutting uh, around it. And the realism of the materials, this video shows it really well, where he's basically cutting into the tissue and it behaves uh, like very fibrous, you know, around the mass uh, specifically. And once that's done, the physician is also able to go in and suture their incision close um, and basically have that very realistic experience. So the model is not only anatomically accurate, but also feels very realistic. So Smriti has seen this video a thousand times and makes these models all the time. I wanna hear Ken's thoughts about how realistic that looks for those of you who can't see the actual video. Well, I've, I've never been in there when any part of the body has been opened up other than mine. Um, <laughs> but yes, it does. I mean, in, in looking at the video, it does seem to replicate um, skin and blood and, and tissue and whatnot. And, and again, I am so far from an expert on, on this field. But yes, I mean, visually, it does, it does seem to create um, a realism um, for, the, for the surgeon or for the, you know, the physician. So until now, the best that you've been able to get is something like this. So this is a hard plastic red heart. And if any of you have ever used a maker bot or a machine like that, you can use a 3D printer to build a hard plastic copy of anatomy. And studies have shown these are very helpful in helping doctors understand the anatomy. But this isn't something you could operate on. And that's the key difference with our technology. With our technology, you can actually cut it open, experience the bleeding, see where the nerves are, learn how to avoid complications, learn what unique challenges that specific patient will present, and develop a surgical plan to avoid those complications. Yeah. And, and Ken, I think you mentioned a, a really important point, which is that as patients, we are not experts in our anatomical, uh, you know, uh, Parts. And then also when, a, when we are given this news that, hey, you know, you are going to have to go through the surgery because you have this tumor mass and we have to operate on it. Um, when, when that information is presented to the patient, obviously it's a, a lot of emotions and it's very traumatizing. Um, and then also given the fact that we don't understand exactly what's going on with, you know, our kidney or our lung or our brain, uh, it creates a lot of anxiety uh, for that lack of knowledge or lack of information. So I think um, in this case where a patient had kidney cancer and it was a very massive tumor, it's difficult to define massive to somebody that doesn't have a baseline to compare that to. So in this case, uh, Dr. Tomaszewski, a surgeon at MD Anderson, um, basically shared the model with their patient to explain to them like, look, this is what's happened. Here are your blood vessels feeding into the tumor directly and the tumor is invading the entire kidney and we are going to do our best. But you know, I wanted to share this with you so you have a better understanding of what your anatomy is. And also I want to assure you that I'm going to rehearse your surgery ahead of time before I do it on you so that I already know 
the game plan before the big day. That, that's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. um, and as you go through that, as, as I listen you know, to you discussing what, what, what Lazarus 3D um, is, is capable of, you know, let's, let's take a step back. I mean, you said that you've been, you started working on this you know, in your kitchen. Um, where does this idea even come from? I mean, do you just wake up one day and say you want to change the arc of, of healthcare? I mean, it's phenomenal. Great well, question. It's yeah. a wonderful question. We were both going to Baylor College of Medicine studying for PhDs, but many people that we met were, were doctors, right? Everyone there is either an MD or a PhD for the most part. So when we were looking at other young professionals in the medical field, um, they were doing things like learning how to suture on a piece of chicken, learning how to perform ultrasounds by putting olives in a piece of bologna, learning how to do robotic surgeries by literally operating on pumpkins and green bell peppers. And this was at one of the leading medical institutes in the country. It's, it's not any better anywhere else. So while cadavers are really useful for learning general anatomy, when it comes to hands-on performing operations, there aren't a lot of good options. You can't really find many cadavers that have brain tumors. So if you wanna learn how to treat brain cancer, how are you gonna do it, right? You can't do it in a pig either. So fundamentally people were learning by this apprenticeship model where they're watching and then slowly taking on more uh, and more responsibility. But what we see statistically is when people first start operating, there's a very high error rate, and it drops pretty rapidly over the first 30 cases. And then we also see these cases where even experienced surgeons know going in, this is going to be a challenge, and they may not know ahead of time whether or not there's going to be a successful outcome for that patient. At the same time, if we look at any other high-risk field, like if you look at aviation, it's not high-risk anymore, but when it first started, it was. When the government required pilots to perform simulation-based training, the frequency of fatal crashes dropped by 90%. And right now in the US, we're looking at a situation where medical errors are the third leading cause of death, where everybody knows medical expenses are through the roof and the single largest line item driving that growth in medical expenses is actually liability and lawsuits, right? All of this can be prevented by reducing errors. And what yeah. we want to do is do for surgery what simulation did for aviation. Yeah. So, uh, so as you said, we did wake up one day uh, <laughs> and we were going to work uh, on the Baylor shuttle. And that's when we learned uh, from a resident, uh, actually a, a fellow in urology, that he had done a surgery on a green bell pepper. And to us, that was terrifying. Um, and we wanted to learn more. And we originally we thought it was a joke, but it wasn't. So we met with his boss, who was the head of endourology um, at one of the hospitals in the Texas Medical Center, which is the world's largest medical center. And that's when we had this great conversation about the, the technology and what are the limitations uh, and how, if such a technology existed, how would that change the game? For, uh, for surgical planning, for patient care, for patient safety and outcomes. Um, and that's when we went back uh, sort of uh, on a uh, drawing board and started outlining, you know, what the steps were to achieve what we were intending to achieve. And really it was a lot of trial and error, a lot of R&D and development in our kitchen um, for a, a while, a long time before we built our first ever patient specific model and brought it to the OR where the surgeon operated on it. And, uh, you know, in their experience, it was like um, operating on the patient itself, uh, the, themselves. So, yeah. That's, that's really cool. Um, but I, I have to ask, I mean, it, we talk a lot about passion, savage, curiosity, audacity, all those things. I mean, those are core values of the show. And I guess they're, they grew out of my core values and but but how does the curiosity come from i mean you started i, I believe both of you started by researching uh, genetic eye diseases yes how do you make that leap you know i mean even if you're interested in something it seems like an incredible leap from inherited eye diseases to 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 lazarus 3d 
It is. It, it absolutely is. Um, we wanted to make real changes in patients' lives. And what we saw was, well, Smriti could, within one month, develop a uh, modified viral vector that could cure a genetic disease in a mouse. The process of getting that into humans literally may take a billion dollars and several decades, assuming you have that funding. So it wasn't really feasible to translate the work that we were doing on the genetic side to direct patient care in the way that we wanted. And at the same time, there was this huge problem in surgery that was staring us in the face that no one was doing anything about, Ken. And when I look at innovations, I think oftentimes the most powerful innovations happen in a field that hasn't been defined yet. Right? If we've already got 100,000 computer scientists working on building a better processor, it's unlikely you and your kitchen are going to do a better job than those well-established companies. But there are a lot of problems out there that no one's really working on, that no one's really tackled in a robust, in a powerful way. So I think looking at those types of problems and, and trying to be the first to solve them is a very powerful thing. Yeah, I would also say that we as humans are curious animals, right? So we're always, curiosity is, is always driving us. Um, and curiosity also drives change in society. So a lot of times somebody may look at a problem and may say, hey, I'm not a, an expert and I shouldn't be the one solving it. However, in this case, when that problem affects you uh, or your loved one, you want to do something about it, right? So um, earlier, um, you know, like a, a few years ago in my life, when I was younger, I lost my aunt to cancer and she had breast cancer. They had treated her and she was cancer free for two years. And then, you know, they're, they're doing their routine checkup and they find out that she has, you know, uh, lesions now in her mm -hmm. lungs, in her liver, in her brain. And it was too late to do anything about it. And it sort of happened, um, you know, abruptly, but really what they found is that there was a, a small amount of those cancer cells left behind in the breast tissue that had spread to the rest of her body. So I felt that if they had just done that part correctly and, you know, really uh, not left this to chance, then this wouldn't have happened. For her, like, you know, it was obviously a lot of, um, uh, I think it was very traumatizing because she had to spend a lot of time in the hospital going uh, through chemo treatments and for her family, my cousins, you know, they were going to lose their mom, which they did. So I think that it affects people in, it's a lot more than, you know, just the patient managing themselves. It's their family, it's their loved ones, and it affects all of our lives. So at that point, you know, in my career, I had this choice where I could have gone and worked in genetics where, you know, I was doing this cutting edge gene therapy uh, development. I was already done with the clinical trials. And really the next step was, well, how do we bring this from bench to bedside? But it seems so simple, but it, it really isn't. And uh, the prior treatment, the only treatment at that point, uh, which had been cleared by the FDA was Luxterna, the first gene therapy uh, treatment for um, uh, retinal conditions in children. And it that work had started in the 90s. And it was a, uh, you know, a multi-tier global level collaboration. Uh, and there were so many phases of clinical trials and testing for efficacy and safety before it was finally on the market decades later. And even at that point, it was so expensive that it was like half a million dollars treatment per eye. And so people will not be able to afford that, right? And so I felt like if I go down that path, I will impact lives. It will just take a long, it will be a long process. And um, with Lazarus, we'd already made so much progress uh, so quickly that we were like, you know, this is definitely a, a more emergent problem that we can tackle now. And it will, it had already helped patients uh, with their outcomes and potentially with their lives. So that was more impactful. While we were still in our kitchen. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, that's incredible. So talk a little bit about what you had to overcome to get it from your, your, your kitchen to, 
to in use. I mean, I, I can't imagine that the materials for 3D printing um, something close to, you know, skin or tissue or, what, or whatnot, we're, we're just sitting on somebody's shelf ready to be ordered. No. So, um, and, and at the incorporation of, again, what looks to be blood, I'm not sure exactly what it is in your model, but how do you actually source and bring these, these ideas together to, to, to make them real? Absolutely, Ken, it was a long process. And the way um, I thought about starting this, uh, we started out with no experience in 3D printing, no experience in looking at medical data, no experience in surgery, no experience in anything related to this, but we wanted to tackle it. And the question is, how can we do this Understanding the fact that we have no resources, we have no financial backing, we really just have ourselves and our time. So I started by building my first 3D printer from parts. There was the RepRap project, so there was an open source design for 3D printers. So I was able to take that, put together a printer, and I actually started uh, by going to anime cons and science fiction conventions and selling random little toys. And that was a way to pay for the plastic that I was using to work on my machines and, and get this running, right? The next step was we knew we had to learn and get really good at analyzing patient data. So I participated in a study, medical center, there were a lot of them going on, uh, where they scanned my brain and I asked the researchers to get a copy of that scan. So I took this scan of my brain, looked through all the different programs that were available and figured out a way to turn this MRI scan into a three-dimensional model of my brain, which I then printed in hard plastic materials. So at this point, still nothing innovative has happened, but I'm st we're starting to learn some skills, right? So then we took this anatomical model and went to lawyers, uh, lawyers for medical malpractice, personal injury type lawsuits, uh, lawsuits where anatomy was important. And we told them, look, we can build these 3D printed anatomical models. We can ensure they are accurate to that patient's data. So now that's a piece of demonstrative evidence. So we got a few lawyers on board and they started paying us real money to get these models for use in these lawsuits. And in the US, that's, that's big business, right? So a single case might be 25% of what our annual income was you know, as PhD students. So that we are then able to take that money and take that experience, reinvest it into building be better improved machinery and really working on the fundamental underlying problem, which is how do we build something like this that has realistic properties, right? And uh, the, the sort of core of it is the fact that we are both scientists uh, by training and you know, I think any scientist will tell you that they're very, very passionate about whatever, you know, questions they have committed themselves to answering. Um, so they will take whatever, they will do whatever it takes to make it happen. So at that time, we were cutting at pig parts uh, from the local butcher shop who was providing us with fresh organs, uh, freshly harvested organs. We For would free. go into <laughs> surgeries uh, because we were really close with uh, some of the collaborators early on uh, with PreSure, they would let us into surgeries where, you know, we were not operating, but we were there to observe. And also uh, every now and then we could get fresh specimens and cut on those specimens. So when we were doing all of our R&D for synthetic materials to mimic these biological uh, tissues, we obviously recognize that there is a very wide range of materials, uh, you know, like muscle from tissue, like muscle from skin or fat from fascia are so different. Tumor from healthy tissue is so different. So we had to learn. Um, it was a lot of learning um, and then also a lot of testing and R&D uh, where we were just playing with whatever we could get our hands on. Right. So if we got our hands on pig parts. Great. If we got our hands on, you know, like uh, fresh explant tissue from like a patient, great. So um, that was a lot of testing and then also a lot of support from experts. So we were working with a mentor who was a radiologist, uh, is a radiologist. Uh, we were working with surgeons who are really subject matter experts in surgery because that's their job. And also we were working with uh, biomedical, uh, biomedical researchers at very uh, well-known institutes that were doing independent testing of our materials so that we were removing bias from our uh, results. 
um, we were they were just doing it, you know, because they wanted to support us. Um, and it was a great partnership and a great opportunity to have their support um, because I think um, everyone wanted to make this happen. So, and like you say, a lot of that is just being audacious, is saying, yeah, I'm a student, but you know what? I'm going to go call up 10 surgeons. I'm going to find their emails from some paper that they publish, write them an email and say, hey, I want to work on this problem. I know I'm a tiny fish. I know you're really busy, but I'd be so appreciative if you could give me a little bit of your time, a little bit of your expertise. And more often than not, over 50% of the time, that person will say, yeah, I'll help you. Right. Mm -hmm. So you can you can do this if you're a student, if you're someone working in a different field, it doesn't matter if you see a problem and you start working towards a solution, you're going to find supporters along the way. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, I love that. One, I love the story. And, and two, I just I, I love that message. And that's why that's why we go to the notion of savage curiosity. I mean, whatever people are interested in. And I mean, we've you know, we, we've spoken to people um, about, you know, cleaning ocean floors or um, mm -hmm. female farmers projects, etc. And, and it's amazing how, how often um, they, they've been working or living sort of adjacent like you were. I mean, you were obviously well indoctrinated in, in, in the medical world or the research and scientific world, um, but something has just moved them. Um, you know, to, to ask those questions and to pursue it with passion. But I, I, I've got to say, um, I've spoken to so many people who started things at home in their kitchen and whatever. This is, this is phenomenal. Um, it's, it's truly, um, it's a special story. And just before, we've got a few minutes left, just before, you told me a wonderful story before about how you met and got started. Can, can you share that with with the audience too? Yeah, absolutely. So, so Jacques was a third year graduate student um, at Baylor College of Medicine and in genetics. Uh, and, and that was the number one program in the country. And I was interviewing. Uh, so in my, even prior to my uh, decision making, I had gone to Baylor, uh, to Houston, where, you know, we were all invited as recruits. Um, and Jacques was giving a talk on his research in uh, neurodegeneration, like identifying um, the genetic causes of it and then sort of working towards uh, automation of that process. So I was really impressed because my work had been on eye development and I was studying how the lens forms, um, you know, from uh, from the get go and how does it how does it undergo all these changes uh, and how does cataract happen and all of these questions. So I was asking him a lot of questions and Right after him, one of the most world-renowned neurosurgeon, uh, sorry, neuroscientists in the in the world, Dr. Huda Zogby, was going to give her talk, and so they were just like, "Hey, you know, let's move it along, let's cut this short." Um, and so she, uh, you know, was able to give her talk, and which was also very exciting. Um, but after this uh, first encounter, where we already had built this sort of connection, like you know, we are intellectuals and we're having this discussion, a, a whole ton of Q and A, we had dinner. Uh, later that evening. And Jacques had brought his own brain and a heart with him. <laughs> and I was just like really shocked that somebody would do that at dinner. Um, <laughs> and, <laughs> and, uh, and it was like a whole table full of, you know, really great students and recruits and faculty. And uh, here we are having this conversation about his brain uh, just casually, you know, over our meal. And, um, and I thought it was like really fascinating that there was so much happening outside of the work that I had seen earlier that morning, which was tied to his thesis project. And this is all, you know, stuff that he had done on his own and sort of built a startup uh, and started, you know, uh, investing his own dollars into making things happen. And I asked him about his vision and he said that, hey, I really think that 3D printing in medicine and in healthcare can drive significant change in the way we, uh, you know, uh, diagnose patients and the way we treat them. And that was like really, really invigorating to me. So although I had made a decision to go somewhere else uh, at a, a different, uh, I guess the number two institute, I changed my mind and ended up moving to Houston uh, because I wanted to be part of that 
uh, environment where I am, you know, I have this, uh, this opportunity to explore whatever my interests are, and it doesn't have to be all about my one project that I'm married to, but I can, you know, have so many other opportunities. So, um, so that's how we met. And uh, when I moved to Houston, uh, I think it was within of the first few months we were on the shuttle together and ended up meeting uh, this fellow sort of, um, uh, it just happened. And we had this great conversation with him and learned about the horrifying truths of how surgery happens. Then I ended up going uh, to a training event uh, in the Texas Medical Center at the simulation center where all residents, fellows, surgeons go to like learn skills. And I had just at that point, like really, really horrified uh, to learn that they're using a flower pot with styrofoam balls and pipe cleaners to create a uterus um, and to learn how to perform very, very critical, you know, procedures like doing a hysterectomy. Um, and so as a woman and as a scientist, you know, this, I, I was just like speechless and, um, yeah, and at that time, uh, somebody had also made a, a suggestion, which was, I was in my PhD program and they were like, hey, you're in your first year, you can consider an MD PhD um, path. And after learning how they get trained, I was just like, no, no, this is like horrible. I'm going to work on fixing this. So that's, um, that's kind of like how I got involved. And Jacques had already been uh, uh, spending a lot of effort um, even before we had met on building his own 3D printers and his own organs, you know, from his own scan. So that was really impressive and um, sort of transitioned into this big opportunity where we're now able to impact people, people's lives. So thank you. Thank you for sharing that. And, and there was a little tidbit I hadn't heard before. So it's so a closing question, Jacques. I mean, were, were you sitting in a booth or an open table when you pulled out your brain and heart? Just, just actually, wondering, that's a new story for me. Actually, interestingly, I showed up a couple minutes late and there was already someone sitting across the table from Sridhi. Um, and it was another one of the uh, uh, people, that, the recruits, right? Um, so I went over to him and I said, hey, I think there are more recruits on this end of the table and more senior students on that end of the table. So would you mind switching seats with me? And Smriti was looking at her menu, right? And then she looks up and like the person who was across from her before was no longer across from her because yeah. I really wanted to explore that uh, conversation and that collaboration further. I, I think it was like 30 people and it was this big open table with, you know, other people you know, families enjoying their meals. And then he just like showed up with these things in their hands. Well, now it's it's a rule like Lazarus 3D. We have a rule where we walk into a meeting or we walk into like a hospital building. We carry organs in our hands because it's a, a really great way to get engagement and excitement from people to ask the question like, what is that? <laughs> <laughs> it, it sounds like it. So, you know, what, uh, Dr. Jacques and Sweetie Zanderville, thank you so so much for this this time together i wish you the best of luck on 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 the launch of pre sure and lazarus 3d and, and i look forward to connecting again and to meeting in person one day and 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 i i look forward to you bringing some some organ samples with you absolutely yeah. come over anytime ken and thank you so much for this opportunity and we look forward to connecting with you and say thank hi you. to the future <laughs> <laughs> thank you take care <laughs>